Well, good morning. We are finally taking our last look at the book of Galatians this morning, and I hope you haven't felt like it's been a drag slogging your way through this book verse by verse. To me, this last sermon is sort of like saying farewell to a precious friend, this wonderful epistle that we've been looking at for the last 14 weeks. So we're on the last few verses in the final chapter, chapter 6. So turn to page 1155 in your pew Bible if you want to, and you can follow along. And it's here that Paul collects some final thoughts that are tied around a couple of the themes that have become familiar in the book of Galatians, and we're going to look at them verse by verse. And he says, first of all, in verse 11, Kind of something strange. He says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now, why would he start the final section like this? It's very unusual for Paul to write a letter with his own hand. He didn't normally do that. His letters were usually written by a scribe, somebody who took down dictation. And the Word of God was coming from him, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it was passed along to a scribe who would write it down. Now, very often, Paul would sign his name at the end, just as you would do if you had a letter that you dictated. You'd have somebody type it or write it down for you, and then you would just sign your name at the end. And that's usually what Paul did. Uh, He does that at the end of 1 Corinthians. He does it at the end of the book of Colossians. Uh, He does that at the end of 2 Thessalonians. He says, I'm writing off with my own hand. That was a typical thing for him to do. But you may remember that the book of Galatians is the first letter in all of his letters. And the way he started out, his tone was very aggressive. And he's fired up, to put it mildly. He doesn't start this letter with kind words that are tender or gracious. He blasts them with fury over the false gospel that they're converting to. That's how he starts. And he's not about to go out and find a scribe somewhere. He's not about to delay the writing of this letter. And so he says, I'm writing with large letters because, well, if you can remember back in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, as you know, it's because of an illness that I first preached to you. And then he says down in verse 15 of chapter 4, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Do you remember that? Why does he say that? Well, in the ancient ancient world, when your eyes went bad, they went bad. There was nothing that you could do to correct that. And I think Paul is saying, you know, you love me enough to have given me your good eyes, if possible. So it may well be that He's not only a professional, not a professional scribe, and not just because he's writing out of urgency with a passion in his heart, but he's also got bad vision, which is another reason, I think, why he's writing this letter himself with large letters. And so he's pointing them to this document, which is the book of Galatians, and it's perhaps unattractive, his handwriting. It's not professionally written. It doesn't look like something a hired scribe would do. It looks very amateurish, probably, and it reflects the scrawlings of a man with bad eyesight. And like every preacher who can't resist a good illustration, he sees in his own writing a metaphor. And he says this in verse 12. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Paul is not concerned about the professionalism of his letter, how things look on the surface. That was never Paul's issue. In fact, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, he said, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. I came to you to testify about God. In other words, I didn't try to impress you with superiority of speech or fancy words. And in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, his enemies literally said of him, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. So back then in a world that prized intelligent discourse, here you have Paul, this unimpressive man that they said was of no account. In other words, he was 
a low life, not a professional scribe. He wasn't a high sounding orator. He didn't come with men's wisdom, and that's what enamored the elite class of people. But Paul's looking at his letter and he's saying, because of my poor eyesight, you know this is hard for me to write with my own hand, but I have something that's so important and so urgent that it couldn't wait, and I didn't have any help, so I just went ahead and wrote it. And unlike the Judaizers who would have been, they would have cared about how things looked, he says, I don't care about that at all. And I'm just kind of reading between the lines here a little bit. But Paul was the type that said, I'm not going to try to impress you with my scholarship, my personal skills, my superficial formalities. I could brag about those things, but I don't. When I came to you, you accepted my message with gladness, although I'm not much to look at. This letter is not written in an attractive way either, but it is the truth, and it is the gospel, and it is from God. That's what Paul was saying. So you've got to hand it to Paul because he's what a Jew would say had chutzpah. He wasn't afraid to point out the hypocrisy also of those who opposed him. And the first thing that he's pointing out here in verse 12 is their pride. The Judaizers were full of it. Pride, that is. He says, they want to impress people by means of the flesh. So that's what legalists do. They show off. And you see this sometimes with preachers today. It seems to me that the more paraphernalia that you wear, the robes, the the stoles, the tassels, the headdresses, whatever it is, it's the outward appearance that matters to those who are full of pride. And often, the blowhard will brag about their accomplishments and display their degrees and make sure that everybody knows that they have a master's degree or a doctorate. Or they'll name drop to show off how connected they are. And it seems to me the more a minister does that, the more they are declaring their hypocrisy. They make a showing of the flesh. They want to make an outward impression of being holy and virtuous. Virtue signaling is how they call it today in our social media world. This was a way of life for the legalistic Jews. It's a way of life for pious people of any false religion. With the Jews, back in Matthew chapter 6, when our Lord was given the Sermon on the Mount, he said directly to them, you're full of pride, and your pride is seen in your giving. You blow a trumpet before you put money in the basket. Your pride is seen in your praying. You make a public display of your prayers. Your pride is seen even in your fasting. You look sickly. You try to draw some kind of attention to yourself that you're, you're fasting. So the first motive for them was pride that they put on a show, and that's why they were boasting in the flesh. The second motive we see in this verse was cowardice. They were cowards. We see that where it says they're trying to compel you, the Galatians, to be circumcised. And the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. You see, the Judaizers had a problem. They were Jewish. They came from the land of Israel and from Jerusalem, many of them. And for that reason, they had acknowledged, at least superficially, that Jesus was the Messiah. So they had gained some level of acceptance in the church, and now they're showing up as if they represent the apostles to the Galatian churches, and they're telling all the believers that they've already begun in the Spirit, but they're not really believers if they're, if they're not committed to the law of Moses as well. They have to be circumcised. Now, why were they doing that? It's because they didn't want to be persecuted by the hardcore Jews that didn't accept the cross of Christ. And I guess in some ways there were Jews that would sort of tolerate it if you believed in Jesus but held on to Judaism. But to believe in Jesus and let go of Moses would mean you'd be persecuted. You would be blackballed. In today's language, you would be canceled. And when hardcore legalistic Jews canceled you, it was done literally. You would be fatally canceled. Because we all know the Jews in Jerusalem and in Israel persecuted the believers of Jesus Christ and wound up slaughtering them, stoning them to death. So there was a big price to pay to declare yourself to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. 
And so these Judaizers were trying to find a middle ground. And they decided that they could follow Christ, but they didn't want to come to him all the way. They remained on the fence, as it were. And so they were in the equally damning position of trying to hold on to law and works as well as faith and grace. And the two positions are like oil and water. They don't mix. You can't have it both ways. And what offended them most was the cross. A dead Messiah? Yeah, that offended them. But what offended them probably more was that the cross declares that you are a sinner. The cross declares that you deserve to die. The cross declares that you cannot please God on your own, whoever you are. Your righteousness, says Isaiah, is filthy rags. There's none righteous, not one. So the cross says that you are helpless and hopeless. To believe in the cross requires genuine repentance, doesn't it? These Judaizers had aligned with the church somehow, accepting Jesus or something about Jesus, but they were still tares among the wheat. They were still messengers of Satan. They were attempting to escape persecution from the Jews who had rejected Jesus by kind of hanging on but only outwardly identifying with the church. But if they hung on to Moses and hung on to the law, maybe they could still be accepted in their old Jewish religious circles that they had grown accustomed to and enjoyed. And additionally, the Romans had actually legalized Judaism, and so if they continued to hang on to Judaism, they wouldn't be persecuted by the Romans either. You see, the Romans saw Christianity as a threat to Caesar. You had to declare that Caesar is, the Lord, is Lord, but Christians wouldn't do that. They said Jesus is Lord. And so if you declare Jesus as Lord, you were technically an insurrectionist. Christians were burned like torches in garden parties for Caesar. Did you know that? It's one of the ways they were persecuted. And so the Judaizers are not only proud legalists, but they're also cowardly. And they held on in order to escape the persecution that comes to those who fully identify with Jesus and cling to the gospel of the cross. And now there's a third characteristic that shows up in their boasting of the flesh, and that is hypocrisy. And we see this in verse 13. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. And yet they want you to be circumcised that they might boast about your circumcision in the flesh. They want to claim the Galatians as their own disciples, converting them to Jewish law, and they can't even keep the law themselves, Paul says. They're a bunch of phonies. That's what a hypocrite is. So they may be super zealous, they may be fastidious, they may go through all of the rituals and rites and wear all the garb and the garments and never miss an assembly of people gathered for some ceremony, but they can't keep the law. They want you to keep it, but they can't. The truth is, nobody can keep the law, and that's why the Lord said in Matthew 23, said of the Pharisees and the religious leaders that they're like whitewashed tombs. They're painted white like a gravestone on the outside, but inside they're full of dead men's bones. They're complete hypocrites, and so they parade their superficial morality, and God really knows their heart that they're lawbreakers and nothing more. And so it's things like this, pride and cowardice and hypocrisy that come together to define the Judaizers. And those same three things really describe all people in false religions everywhere. And Paul's saying to the Galatians, you don't want to be part of that. Don't have anything to do with them. They don't want the cross because nothing in the history of the world cuts down human pride like the cross. It pops the balloon of the inflated ego. At the foot of the cross, we're all humbled and shrink down to our true size. And proud sinners don't like that. So Paul says, as he looks at his large, scrawling letters, they remind me of those who are corrupted you. They've corrupted you for show. They're boasting in the flesh. 
But Paul, he has a different attitude. He boasts as well, but not in the flesh. Look at verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is the key verse within this passage. May it never be, he says. May genoito is the Greek, may genoito, sometimes translated, God forbid. He's saying it's not possible that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul boasts in the cross. Think about that. The cross was a tool used for crucifying criminals. Why would you boast in that? A little history about crucifixion. It was originally designed by the Persians who became skillful at using, uh, using it as a way to execute people in a very long, drawn-out, torturous way. But it was really perfected by the Romans who crucified tens of thousands of people. And in fact, some historians tell us that as many as 30,000 people were crucified by the Romans in and around the land of Israel at the time of our Lord. And so the Jewish people were used to seeing people hanging on crosses in the process of bloody, excruciating death by crucifixion. It was not only an instrument of physical torture, but it was also a tool of degradation. To be suspended high on a public highway, totally naked, by the way, nailed hand and foot, and left to bake in the sun while gawking crowds looked up to be attacked by birds and insects and end up as kind of roadkill, that was about as degrading as anything that could ever be done to a human being. The Romans basically crushed potential revolt by making sure that the roads were lined with crucified victims. And it's the cross, Paul says, that I'm going to boast about. I can't boast about myself. I can't boast about my righteousness. I can't boast about my morality or about my goodness. I can simply boast that God graciously, mercifully loved me enough to put my sins on His Son and died in my place. And so for us as Christians, the cross is everything to us. The cross is our means of redemption. The cross is the magnet that draws us to love the Savior. The cross is a part of our fellowship. It's the fellowship of suffering. The cross is our message. Why did he surrender to the cross and boast about it? Reason number one, the cross frees us from the world's bondage. Verse 14, through which, that is the cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. When you come to God in faith through Jesus Christ, you die to the world and its system. Suddenly it holds no power over you anymore. You look at life differently and you don't boast about your own accomplishments. You boast about what Christ has accomplished through the cross. And then Paul says in verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. And what he means is, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, okay? The Jews were circumcised, Gentiles uncircumcised. So neither of those matters anymore. What counts is whether or not God has renewed your spirit through repentance and faith in Jesus. That's what matters. So the frustration of religious self-effort, the frustration of works-based religion is gone. I'm a new creation In the language of John, I've been born again. I have a new heart. I have a new spirit. I have a new capacity to love God and do his will. That's the new creation he's talking about there. And then in verse 16, he says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. Christians have peace with God because we've received mercy. We're no longer under the death sentence that unbelievers fear because we've been forgiven. And so as Christians, we're now included as part of God's chosen people, just as if we were Jews. 
That's what he meant by the phrase, the Israel of God. This is a direct hit against the Judaizers and the false teachers. They are not the Israel of God. They think they are. Because you see, there's an Israel that's not of God. That's the unbelieving Jews. But those who today are Messianic Jews, as well as believing Gentiles, that would be us, we are the Israel of God, believers, both Jews and Gentiles. Then Paul wraps up this great letter, verse 17, he writes, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Think about who he's talking to here. He's talking to everybody. He's talking to the people in the church who are making life miserable because they're listening to false teachers. And he's talking to the false teachers who are attacking him. But on what basis, Paul? Why should we leave you alone? Because I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. In other words, I have scars for my service to Christ. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, when he's defending his apostleship there, he defends it by saying, I was beaten with rods, I was whipped, I was thrown in prison, and he goes on through this whole litany of things, and these are the marks that I bear for Christ. You know, they would hit Christ, but he's not here, so they hit me in his place, he says. So I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The reason that I'm beaten, the reason I'm being abused, is not because of something that I've done. It's because of who I represent. Those are his apostolic credentials. He's saying, don't question my authority because I have the marks of Jesus. And who could argue that? And then in a final farewell, which is a blessing or a benediction, he says in verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. You know, this final passage we looked at this morning, in essence, is focused on the cross. The table in front of me, the Lord's table, focuses us on the cross. Behind me you see a large cross on the wall. The cross is the symbol of Christianity. That's all the decoration that you ever need in a church building is just a cross. The cross has been the symbol of Christianity since the Lord's death. It stands atop many churches around the world at the top of their steeples. But the cross also descends from the top of churches way down to people's necks. Some of you might have a cross around your neck this morning. Beautiful little crosses become jewelry that we display. And we wear them as a symbol of beauty. And that's an odd thing because I don't know of anybody who ever had a guillotine around their neck, at least not as jewelry. And I don't think there's any torture instrument that's ever been invented by a man that someone wears as jewelry, as some kind of adornment and viewed as beautiful. But that's what happens with the cross. The cross may be the most heinous and horrendous and horrific of all torture instruments ever devised by man, and it should be a symbol of shame, but it's become a symbol of love and joy, peace and beauty and grace and eternal salvation. And that's quite odd for a torture instrument to be considered as such. The cross, then, was a diabolical device to torture criminals to death with the exception of one cross. One cross was a divine device to deliver sinners from death, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the cross we wear around our necks, and we rejoice in that cross, and we write songs about the cross. At the cross, near the cross, the old rugged cross, the wonderful cross, hallelujah for the cross. And there's one we often sing, when I survey the wondrous cross, which goes back to Isaac Watts in 1707. He wrote it after reading Galatians 6.14. The Christian cross is not mythical, it's not mystical, it's historical, and it's real. And the Bible gives the history of that one cross, and it has become a symbol of beauty. 
To most people, the cross was offensive. It was offensive to the Jews because there was no way in their messianic theology that they would see the Messiah ending up on a cross crucified by unclean Gentiles. And in spite, in spite of what they would have read in Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22, they didn't expect the Messiah to be crucified. So the cross was a stumbling block for them. It was a barrier to believing that Jesus was the Messiah. And then to the Greek or the Gentiles, the cross was just foolishness. To imagine that a crucified Jew, rejected by his own leaders and nation, crucified like a common criminal by Roman soldiers in that little place called Jerusalem, to think that he was actually the eternal creator God of the universe and the only savior of the world, that was to them, the Gentiles, a form of absurdity. So the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to unbelievers. To Gentiles, it's foolishness. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. But he adds, to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Because in the cross, the power of God is being displayed, the power to fully expel all divine wrath against all who would ever believe throughout human history through the death of God's Son. And yet, in that power, it didn't destroy him completely. Rather, he came to life three days later. And the cross is the determining factor of everyone's eternal destiny. What you do at the cross determines what happens to you in the afterlife. Embrace the cross and the death of Christ for sin. Embrace him as your Lord and Savior, and you have eternal life. Reject the cross. Reject the one who paid for the sins of all who would believe well then, if you reject it, your end is eternal, unending destruction, and that's why I say how you view the cross determines your destiny. You see, there's only two roads to heaven, two ways to get to God, only two religious paths, and one, one path is the religion of human achievement. In other words, you earn your way by your morality, by your goodness by your religiosity, by the ceremonies, the rituals, and the rites. The religion of human achievement is the category in which all false religions on this planet fit. They're all just different forms of the religion of human achievement. And there's no hope for the people who try to come to God that way. The only other path is the true religion of divine accomplishment where everything's done by God, and it's offered to us only by grace, and it's received by faith, not works. That's what Paul's been dealing with throughout this whole letter. And if I were to sum up the book for you in one sentence, it would be this. We cannot be justified by performing any works by the law, but only by faith in Jesus Christ. Get it? Good.